<laughs> and I have to admit, I preached the second Sunday of Advent, and I thought that was my last one. And John said, no, <laughs> you don't get to get, get by that easy. So here I am again. I have one more sermon to preach to you. Um, so all of a sudden I had to think of what I wanted to say to you this morning on my last Sunday. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm probably going to cry at different moments through this, so let's, this is my disclaimer, and we'll, we'll get through it. Um, so, our scripture this morning, we'll just jump right in, is from Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. I'll let you turn your page, and I'll get myself together in a second. It's not that easy to find it. <laughs> Ephesians 3, verse 14, right at the end of Ephesians. Well, no, just kidding, in the middle of Ephesians. Um, so it says this, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives his name. So I'm going to read this for you. <laughs> um, I pray to out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through the Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may draw in your heart to faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to know how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these words from Ephesians, and we thank you for the blessing and the challenge that they provide to us. We pray that we will hear you speak to us this morning. And that we'll leave this place a little different than when we came in. And then we pray. Amen. Sorry, just a second. <laughs> so, of all the verses that I know in Scripture, these offer the best simultaneous blessing and challenge that I can think of. On a personal note, these have been with me through a lot of different moments in my life. They were our wedding verse when Jeremy and I got married. Um, we used them in Nora's baptism about a year ago, which is a pretty special day for us. And when I was in, in college, um, I was tasked with an assignment one summer when I was on an internship to choose kind of a life verse, and this is what I chose. Um, so they're important verses to me. And part of why they're so important to me is I think that they do hold both a blessing for us today and a challenge as we go forward. They contain words of great comfort and healing and joy, as well as a vision for our lives as we take our next steps. So, we'll start with the blessing, and hopefully get all the crying out of the way, and then we'll get to the challenge and <laughs> get that together. So, um, first, Paul prays that God's people might find power through the Holy Spirit so Christ could dwell in our hearts through faith. In other words, Paul prays that the Spirit would open us up to knowing Christ well and knowing him fully. The Spirit would work in our hearts and through our hearts so we could really know Christ. That's the first blessing here. Paul writes, I pray that you would know Christ and know him fully. I pray that each one of us would let the Spirit work in us and that the Holy Spirit would work in great power so we can know Christ, really know him in our heart of hearts. And what's more, that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith. That's another key phrase right there. Not just in knowledge, not just that we would know Christ, but that he would dwell in our hearts that he would be in us and around us and through us, through faith. That Christ would be part of each one of us because of this deep, abiding hope in things unseen that we all claim and call faith. That we have this power through the Holy Spirit to really, truly know Christ deep in our bones. And that we would have faith in him. Faith that changes our outlooks and our lives and our worldviews. That's the first blessing that Paul gives us and that I have for you this morning, that each one of us would really, really know Christ, that the Spirit would work in us so that we could know him deeply and well. But Paul goes on, and this is the part that I really love so much. He says, I'll read it again. He says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul prays that the believers would grasp, really understand just how big 
God's love is. Not just know it, but grasp it, hold it, really get it, just how big it is. And it's so big that Paul puts his love in terms of geometry. He gives it dimension. It's, it's big, it, has this, it fills up space. It's not just a square, it's a cube. Right? Not just a quadrilateral, but a three-dimensional quadrilateral. My engineer father-in-law will probably you know, change my, my <coughs> terminology there. But it's, it's big, and it has height, and depth, and width, and length. God's love takes up space in our lives and in our world. I've, I've often gotten together with Gwen, our preschool teacher, um, who's here during the week. And we've, we've often just gotten together just to pray over the preschool together. And our prayer, every time we've done this, has been that each person that walks through the doors of our preschool and ultimately our church would leave knowing that they were loved by us and by God that day. We pray that for everyone to come, whether it's a child coming for preschool, whether it's a parent who's quick dropping them off and running back to the car so they can get to work on time or a volunteer. That's our prayer, that they will know by the time they leave that they are loved by God in some small way. And it's a, it's a really simple prayer, but it's kind of a summary of the vision for that place. We want people to know that they're loved by us and, more importantly, by Christ. So Glenn and I have prayed that over and over, and I've sort of taken that prayer into other aspects of my life. I pray that each Sunday, as I come to worship for all of you, that all of you would know that you are loved by me and by each person here and by Christ. I pray it when I come here for meetings with our elders, with our staff. I pray it when I meet people for coffee. I pray it before I get together with friends. Um, it's become sort of this all-encompassing prayer for my life. And I, I hope that, that each one of us here, whether we're here for two hours or two minutes, at least experiences some little piece of that big, big love of Christ. And I hope that it's an experience of that kind of multifaceted, multidimensional love that Paul writes about to the Ephesians. I pray that it's something beyond just warm fuzzies. I'm not, I'm not interested in a church where people walk in and just leave feeling good about themselves. I'm not interested in a church that just is about boosting our egos or inspiring us a little bit. I want that. Sure, we all want to feel good about ourselves, but I want people to really, truly grasp just how big God's love is. This love that takes up space, that's full of dimension, that's high and wide and long and deep. This love that surpasses knowledge, Paul writes. This love that begs to be grasped, not just known. What a huge, beautiful blessing it is for us to be included in those who do know and experience that love. And may we truly experience it. May you truly experience it and truly grasp it each and every day. That's the blessing half of this passage for me. But I think there's a really important challenge hidden in here as well. For me, every time I pray that prayer with Gwen, that people would come here and know that they're loved, there's this little nudge inside of me. Well, it's less of a nudge and more of a shove, I think. God, God always kind of says, okay, Jana, great prayer. What are you going to do about it? There's always kind of that next step that I, I feel from God saying, what are you going to do to show that love when people walk through those doors, when you're out meeting friends, when you're in the grocery store? That throughout history, God has told his people that we've been blessed to be a blessing. We've been saved so we can share the good news of salvation. All the way back to God's covenant with Abraham in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 12, God tells Abraham, I'll make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. God says, I will bless you and you will be a blessing to others. Again, in Zechariah 8, 13, God says to his people, Israel, once again, I'll save you so that you can become a blessing. And Jesus himself, when he sends out his disciples to do ministry in Matthew 10, he says, as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, because freely you've received, now freely give. Again, blessed to be a blessing, saved so we can save, share that message of salvation. <clears throat> Just as you received, now give. Just as you've been blessed, now go out and bless others. 
time and time again, God reminds us that we have this blessing of knowing this big, all-encompassing, multi-dimensional love of Christ so that we can share it with others. Freely we received, now freely we must give. So if this is our prayer, if this is my prayer, that we would grasp just how high and wide and long and deep is the love of Christ, how can we not share that with others? This prayer, this blessing for our lives needs to shape our lives. It needs to transform our lives. It needs to define our lives. We as God's people have been blessed. We're blessed that Christ dwells in our hearts through faith, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're blessed that we have been given power along with all of God's holy people to know this big, big love of Christ. And because of, and in the midst of all of this, we have to share that. We have to. We have to live in ways that invites others to grasp this love along with us. In all we do, we have to show what it means to have Christ dwell in our hearts through faith. Perhaps the first step in living out this prayer is to keep it on our lips at all times. Maybe the first step in living this out is to, to pray it in all places for all people, not just for ourselves, not even just for Harvard Church, but for the cashier at the grocery store this afternoon when you stop and buy some milk, or for your coworkers, or our friends, or our family members, or the person you see walking to the bus on your way to work tomorrow morning. Maybe the first step is just praying this for all people we meet along the way. And then to recognize that nudge, or that shove, maybe, that God puts inside us that says, okay, good prayer, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to show that love? That's what we're here to do. That's why the church exists, so we can all grasp, all people can grasp Christ's big, big love. So, friends, as we go from here, let's live in ways that beg the question to which Jesus is the answer. Let's live in ways that showcase this love of Christ at all times, with all people, in all places. And in our living, let's invite others to know this love that's high and wide and long and deep as well. Because we're blessed. I want you to be blessed and to know you're blessed and to be a blessing to others. Because we're blessed for a reason. Freely we received, now freely let's give. And ultimately it comes down to these next verses that Paul writes that ends this, this passage of scripture so beautifully. Where he writes, now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine. According to his power that's at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.